Good morning uh, and welcome to this morning's Nano Exploration Seminar. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Yen Ping Chi. He's a fourth year graduate student uh, working with Professor Kristen von Vliet and Professor Bilge Yildze. Um, the work he's going to tell us about today is on the use of the external field effects on defects in functional log sites and he will blend his experience in both experiments and simulations. So without further ado, uh, Yen Ting, please do take over. If you have questions for Yen Ting, uh, please hold them towards the very end of the talk. Uh, you can send them to me via a chat or to everyone and I'll make sure I relate them to Yen Ting. Or alternatively, you can raise your hand and we'll call upon you so you can be heard. So Yen Ting, please take over. Uh, thank you, Professor Polovich. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Yen Ting, and I'm a PhD student working with Professor Venvli and Professor Yodit. And uh, it's my honor to like be able to give a talk here. Um, so, <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about the electrophilic field effects on defects in functional oxides, which will include uh, both uh, some experiment work and simulation work. And this is just some little cartoon that I make. Uh, seem like uh, basically representing the oxide usually work under some strain, some temp like high temperature and some like high electric field, uh, which I'm going to uh, introduce today. So uh, first of all, uh, let me just uh, introduce what are these functional oxides. Uh, probably the most uh, famous example is a solid oxide fuel cell. It's a clean energy uh, application. Uh, so nowadays we don't really want to just uh, uh, produce further pollution to our earth, so it's uh, they are more and more focused on it. And the second thing will be the nanometer, which is a storage device that we can use for uniformic uh, computation. And the third thing uh, we are very familiar with is the lithium battery in our phone. And of course, there are still like thermoelectric oxides, magnetic oxide that can be used in all kinds of applications. And although there are di these kind of different applications and different kind of oxides, actually effects uh, play a very important role in the performance of these oxides. So other than the kind of uh, in intuition you will have like defects bad, uh, manipulating and controlling these defects in the oxides is very important of giving us a very uh, a good device that perform, uh, perform well. <clears throat> so first of all, uh, just let me uh, introduce basically a simple schematic of how the solar oxide fills will work. Um, uh, so on the left hand side, you feed in the field, in this case, the hydrogen. Hydrogen gives out electron, a pass through whatever you want to power up, and then the oxygen takes the electron back. And in the middle is an electrolyte, which to, to form a full circuit, you need the oxygen vacancy migration. And then that's where uh, we, are, we care more about, uh, like the solar part, because uh, like the, the, higher, <clears throat> the higher the mobility of the, solid, the, the oxygen vacancy, the, the, the higher the efficiency this whole thing will be. And the second thing is memristor. So for people who are not familiar with the memristor, here I'm just showing a very simple uh, example of how it should look like. So uh, we have two metal electrodes and with a functional oxide in between. So it's like a sandwich. When we apply bias, oxygen vacancy will go to one direction. And then in this case, it will form a conductive filament and then bridge the two sides. In this case, the conductivity of the whole device is high. Uh, so you can see it's a kind of like a one in the storage device. And when you apply negative bias, the oxygen vacancy moves to the other direction. So you break the bridge and then make the whole uh, thing's conductivity lower. So you can see this as a zero state. You can see in both cases, uh, like electrons oxygen vacancy plays a very important role of uh, the operation principle. So how can we improve the device performance through controlling the defects? So in this talk, I'm going to break it down to three different parts. The first is uh, how the strain can affect both the electronic and ionic defect. And first, in the computational study, I will use strontium titanate as my uh, model material. Uh, and the second one will be an experiment demonstration, uh, which can be applied to basically all kinds of oxides that you're interested in, either a bulk material or a thin film material, uh, thin, thin film device. And the third part will be studying the ultra high electric field effect on defect formation. And I again use the strontium titanate as the model material. Okay, so let's get started. Um, 
if we were going to talk about the string, like why do we care about the string? Uh, so first of all, string, uh, if we like a ferroelectric field cares about the string a lot because for ferroelectric material, it has the it has polariz polarization or dipole moment on its own even without doing anything to it. And by applying strain, um, either by cell strain or some kind of other any form of strain, you might just change the the face or the uh, ion position in the material and then change the polarization, which is the, the uh, physical property we all care about in that field. So here I'm just showing a strain phase diagram where you can, you don't really have to understand what these mean. These just mean like different phases. Uh, but what I want to show here is when you apply an implant strain, because you change the, uh, uh, the symmetry, you can form different phases and then you can have different polarization strength. A uh, second example is in uh, bismuth ferrite. Uh, again, when you apply the bisphosphate strain, you can basically di displace the ion or have some local octahedral distortion, so you can also change the polarization. So here, this is just an example of how what the strain can do and what has been studied in ferroelectric field. Uh, although I'm not going to uh, go into detail today. The second part is what we are interested in more is how the strain can change the field formation and the transportation property. So in general, uh, it is believed that when we apply the strain in tension, meaning stretching the material, we can decrease the migration barrier of the point defect, in this case, oxygen vacancy. So we can see if we apply the tensile strain, we can enhance the conductivity of the whole device. And furthermore, if we apply the strain, we can also change the uh, formation energy of the defect because the conductivity is basically the product of uh, the vacant, the, the carrier concentration and the carrier mobility. So we also have to care about how many carrier we have. In this case, the line is just a simulation study for the strontium vacancy formation energy. So, um, and then, and then the, the material here, meaning the substrate that you can choose when you grow this material on it, and then if you grow it epitaxially, you can create uh, different strain on your, on, on your thin film device. So vacancy concentration is proportional to like the exponential minus uh, formation energy over KT. Like, uh, when we see the term is an exponent, we will see that actually it has a very high dependence on, on the temperature. And then the, even a small change of the value can give us a very large uh, change. So um, just give a sense of how much will change. Uh, like around zero, zero strain, it is around like four EV. And then when we like, if we can actually compress it to uh, three percent, it can go down to three point four EV, and then we will have ten to four times more of our carrier at at five hundred C. So you can see strain can actually change the uh, the performance of the device a lot. <coughs> so as I mentioned above, uh, we really we know that we already know that the strain can increase the uh, performance of the device. And then now let's just think in backward. Now the solid oxide fail cell, its issue uh, is that in order to have a good performance, we have to increase the temperature to more than 500 C. So how about we do something to it so it can, we can lower its operation temperature? Because if you have to operate very high temperature, the cost will be very high, and then the degree will have to care about the degradation, and then also some film expansion, those kind of issue and then everything will just be unstable and then it's not cost uh, efficient. Um, and originally, if we were just talking about the bulk material, uh, there won't be that possible because it is unlikely that you can create enough strain to cause the change on the bulk material, and on, on especially this kind of brittle material such as oxides. However, uh, nowadays things are getting smaller and smaller. So we can have functional oxide thin film. If it is thin enough, then we can like uh, 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 introduce larger strain that it, we could achieve in bulk net material. And in fact, even if you don't want the strain in your device, you will still get some residual strain after you grow the film. Um, because like I said, the film is very thin and then it is very easily um, affected by all external forces. So, <clears throat> So here, uh, we already know that conductivity will increase when we apply the strain. Uh, however, for the ionic defect, there are still some, I would say, like quite a lot 
discrepancy in between different studies, both computationally and experimentally. Uh, and for the electronic uh, conductivity, which we still care for some conductor, it is not well uh, quantified in oxides. So here the main goal is, uh, the main question here uh, I want to ask is, how can we accurately quantify the strain effects on conductivity in functional oxides? So the first work is a computational work where we study the stress or the strain effect on strontium titanate. And first we uh, study the hydrostatic stress, meaning that you apply the same amount of stress, same amount of strain in all three principal axes on your material. So there are two, so in the electron in strontium titanate, it can be two forms. One is just free electron as I show here, and the other one is small polaron. So small polaron is basically just a localized electron on titanium. I mean, it can localize on different kinds of cation if you are in different material, but strontium titanate is localized on titanium. So we can just imagine that some titanium become three plus. Um, so since the electron is localized, <coughs> um, when it wants to transfer, the transport, it cannot be as easy as uh, the free electron because it has to hop from one titanium to the other side. Um, so this actually gives them very different transport property. And in this uh, predominant diagram, we have shown that the free electron basically dominates most of the region and the small polaron only dominates at high temperature compressive region and then low temperature tensile region. And since we use give free energy, because that's what we control in the simulation, uh, the pressure times volume term is very important in stabilizing the small polaron. However, for hydrostatic strain, uh, basically it's very um, impractical to do in experiment. Uh, as you can see, you have to create like around uh, five to 10 of gigapascal on the material, which is definitely not uh, like going to happen if we were going to uh, do experiment uh, in real life. And for the thin film, we can create large enough strain to see some changes. So the next question is, are these observations still hold under biocell stress? Um, <clears throat> so there's some previous study about studying how the biocell strain affect the electron property. Uh, this is the first, it's a theoretical study where it predicts the effective mass of electron will decrease when you apply a tensile strain biocellally, not hydrostatically. Um, so in this case, if you apply a 1% biocell strain, you can decrease the electron effective mass to uh, 40%. So they predict the mobility of the electron will go higher. So in the end, you will have a higher conductivity. Uh, another experiment results, they grow the film and they tax it and then create the strain. And when they stretch the uh, strontium titan of film, they actually found a resistant increase and then that's due to the decrease of mobility. So there's a very clear con con contradiction between these two studies. And <clears throat> so which one is right? And I believe that's actually not the correct question that you should ask because they might all be correct. Um, since both studies have not think about uh, the electron being a small polar. So it is possible that the free electron effective mass does decrease when you apply tensile strain. However, if the small polar on got uh, stabilized more by tensile strain, and then it got dominated, become the dominating species of this electron, then you will not see how the free electron behaves in the experiment. And I believe that's what they see in the experiment because um, like when, when you increase <coughs> The, the, when, you, when you increase the concentration of small polaron, basically you decrease the conductivity of your, of your thin film. So I believe that incorporating small polaron in studying the strain effect is very important, other than just looking at the free electron and how the strain affects them. <coughs> so in my simulation study, this is just a very simple outline of my, <coughs> sorry, uh, my, my model. I used VASP as the zero K calculation, and then I used FOMP to uh, like a, uh, Ptolemy model to capture the behavior uh, of finite temperature. I use GJ plus U and then use PV to show the potential and then my strain varies from minus 5% to 5% and then temperature ranging from zero to 1000 K. So we can, after having those uh, the, the things set up, we can just calculate the energy difference between free electron and then small polaron structure and conduct this uh, and then create this pre diagram. <clears throat> so here I use Hemholtz free energy instead of Gibbs free energy. 
Uh, I have the Lagrange transform in my backup slide if people are interested in why I should use Hamel's free energy instead of the free energy. But here, just believe me that this is what we should use. Um, so when we apply the Bagshaw strain using Hamel's free energy, we can compare the energy difference between two structures. And then by finding the zero energy, meaning they are the same, we can basically make the uh, Kudansa diagram this way. If we look at the internal energy, with the only difference between these two energy are the uh, entropy term. So it's very clear and then makes the reasonable that at, at higher temperature, uh, the species have higher entropy will dominate and then free electron has higher entropy. <coughs> so to validate the prediction, I, uh, we uh, found the, the other group in Singapore, not, uh, not, not us, that have done the uh, uh, conductivity measurement of the strength Film in in, uh, in STO. So this is uh, this is the uh, basically the carrier density of a 0.5 wave percent doped ni niobium STO. So it's uh, it has a fixed amount of electron in this in this material, and then they grow the thin film on different substrates to create different implant strain. And in this case, they it is minus three percent compressive, minus one percent also compressive, and then plus one percent taking tension. So by uh, conducting the whole measurement, they can get the carrier mobility of the thin film, <coughs> like with the temperature and in all, all in all three samples. If we just enlarge this and then compare with my pre-Nelson diagram, um, let's look at the one with tension, which is the blue triangle here. As you can see, they are very different. And then this one is very temperature sensitive. And then here I call it thermally activated. So if you remember uh, how the small polar uh, transport, it hops from one titanium to the other. So it has an uh, energy barrier it has to conquer. The energy barrier is not high, but still it is in the exponential term. So when you doing the uh, Arrhenius uh, equation fitting, you can get the activation energy. And then that's what <coughs> we found here from the experiment. For the compressive com compressed thin film, Basically, it is more like a temperature insensitive. And then if you fit it, it is proportional to the uh, log temperature minus power by minus half or minus, minus uh, three half, I forgot. <laughs> but like anyway, it is the, it is the uh, classic um, behavior of how free that depends on the temperature. So here, basically, I'm just showing the mobility for the dominant electronic difference fit between my experiment and their uh, experiment. Uh, by, sorry, by my Fredonson diagram and their experiment. So we have talked about how the strain can affect the electronic defect simulation. Right? So now let's talk about how 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 the how the ionic defect behaves on the strain. So there are a lot of research looking into this. Of course, in the beginning, it is some simulation study, and then say it's very promising, and then there are some. Uh, experiment that will predict the same film, and then we and then and then have different kind of results. So as you can see here, uh, I'm showing a simple example using yttria stabilized zirconia (YZ) uh, as a solvent C electrolyte. Uh, this is basically the conductivity uh, increase uh, between strain and on-strain sample. So it includes both calculation and experiment study. So you can see that basically it can be divided to two branches. One group of people say, hey, it's very good, it's very promising, and the other group of people say, no, it's useless. Um, so why do we see this <coughs> controversy? In experiment, uh, when we want to apply epitaxial uh, strain to the thin film, we choose a thin film that has a different lattice constant with the substrate, or sorry, reversely, we choose a substrate that has a different lattice constant with the thin film. We roll the thin film on it, and then it can either be stretched or compressed. Um, however, the quality of the thin film is very critical in actually creating this kind of strain. And also, the thin film cannot be too thick, otherwise, the strain will just relax. And here, I'm just showing some example of what will happen if you don't really have a very good selection of the substrate. So here, if you grow strontium titanate on LAO, in between, there will be a 2D electron gas. So when you measure the when you're measuring the conductivity of your strontium titanate thin film, uh, I believe the 2D electron gas will definitely affect the absolute value that you measure. And the second thing is <clears throat> if you have defects, like this look, I'm not talking about point defect, but more of like uh, like a 
dislocation or, or grain boundaries or kind of like a dislocation threat, it can also affect the uh, conductivity measurement that you conduct of the film. So in the end, due to this technique of how people apply the strain, it will be a comp the final result will be a competition between the microstructure effects and the strain effects. So in this experiment setup, we want to deconvolute the different factors. So we aim to mechanically strain only one sample over a range of five strains. So meaning that even, even though we might have this dislocation or we might have all those kinds of defects in the beginning, if we can just apply the strain on one sample and then measure the conductivity along with the strain, uh, we have the same starting point. So we don't really have to care about sample to sample difference or these kind of different substrate difference. Because when you apply different strain on, on the same thin film in, in this technique, you will have to use different kinds of substrates. Uh, this is just a basic overflow of the <coughs> of my experiment setup. So first I do the photolithography in TRL or nano zoom. Um, and I have my inter in interdigitated electro pattern on my uh, on my on my sample. So it can it, it becomes the current collector and then you can collect uh, more current by having those fingers. And second I deposit the platinum and then the third picture is just showing some uh, like uh, finished samples that I have. And in the end, I will conduct the conductivity measurement when like, and then with the applied strain all at the same time. <coughs> so here, basically in short, I'm going to do a conductivity measurement at high temperature with gas control because some functional oxides, they are like mixed conductor and then they can exchange uh, oxygen with the air. <coughs> With the atmosphere, uh, which will change their, uh, the, the carrier concentration. And then also, I want to apply the strain, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, in situ, because uh, some of the technique, you can create one strain at room temperature and then you just raise the temperature up. However, um, due to thermal expansion and then all of other factors, I don't think that's a very good technique. Uh, so, what we want to do here is actually apply the strain in situ under the operation condition of the functional oxide. So there are a lot of things we have to do at the same time. <clears throat> so here I'm just showing an optic microscope uh, image of what my pattern looks like because I did this uh, in now. I just want to show like what we can do here. Um, basically we have the, um, the, the finger distance, finger meaning this uh, thing rectangular thing here. Uh, the distance between them are two micron and then the width is two micron. I have 14 pairs here. So actually this is a very narrow region here. Um, very, very, very narrow region here. This pattern is not very easy to make because <clears throat> it has a very high aspect ratio. Not only the, the smallest feature size is closing to one micron, which I believe it's the limit of the MLA in TRL and nano, uh, but also that I cannot really, I cannot risk to have any kind of deviation along this long finger. So you can imagine this has a two micron width, but it has around three millimeter length. So I have to make sure that it is two micron in width in all this distance. Otherwise, as long as like it become a little bit fatter in the, in, the, in the middle or it become a little bit thinner than the finger basically just break. Uh, all, of, like, basic, all of my divider will just not work because it will either short it or just break. So this took me some time like weeks for me to figure out and like I'm glad it works now and actually the reproducibility of the recipe is uh, very high. I think it's like almost a hundred percent now. <coughs> So how are we going to strain the sample uh, in situ? Here I'm just showing, uh, and we, we choose bending as the method. And now here I'm just showing a three-point bending schematic uh, to show how, how it should look like. So for three-point bending, of course we have two points. And uh, we have a loading point in, in the middle. And then we have two supporting points, basically hold the sample. And if we are bending a beam, we have to look at this uh, called the neutral axis. Above neutral axis is in tension, below the neutral axis it is in compression. So 
actually the string is not uniform across the sample and we grow the film on the top of the substrate so it can uh, be applied the highest tensor strain because it is the strain uh, is proportional to the distance from the neutron axis and we look at the top view the strain is also not uh, the same uh, <coughs> in uh, x y direction it is the highest where you where you have the loading point and then it is zero low or zero where you where you are, are closing to the supporting point so if we want to use three-point bending and then we want to measure the conductivity chain uh, with respect to one strain value, we have to make sure that it does not really cross a very large region. I cannot just uh, grow my, all of my electrical pattern across the sample because it will be collecting the signal uh, under a different strain. That's why we have to make the finger distance very, uh, finger width very small so they can be all concentrating in the middle uh, and we can uh, attribute the current, uh, collect the current to be under one string value. And the second thing is since uh, this is an example of using single crystal YZ, uh, this won't be a problem if we are measuring actually a thin film, but if we are measuring bulk material, we have also have to care about how deep the current goes. If the distance between your finger is too large, then the current can go deeper. And then as I just mentioned about the string across the the sample in Z direction is also not uniform. Then in that case, you will also uh, have the signal uh, under different strain. That's why I have to have a very thin finger and then make them very, very close. So in the end, uh, with this setup, I can measure the impedance, which is the method that we use to uh, that basically convert it to conductivity and then in the end get the activation energy at the highest strain of the region when we use three-point bending. So this is a uh, like experiment setup that that I <clears throat> that I want to show here, it is still going on, so I'm not going to go into details. So we have a stage made of alumina, so we can uh, apply the strain at high temperature. Like this alumina is safe to even above 1,000 C. We use the S-type thermal cover just uh, uh, next to the sample, so we can measure the temperature accurately. And we also have a very ga good gas control here. I'm just showing that. Uh, with my setup, I can reach down to 1.2 ppm of PO2 when we are passing to pure nitrogen. So basically, this is already the uh, what's that? The concentration or the purity of the gas tank. So uh, everything is self-made because we don't really find a device that can do everything at the same time. So we have to construct this device uh, from scratch. And here, I just want to acknowledge the help. Uh, of MIT Central Machine Shop, Andrew Ryan. He helped me a lot of designing uh, the whole thing. Uh, so it made me able to have the alumina stage, which is able to bend uh, the, the sample, and then also the ability to apply dynamic strain at high temperature with gas sealing. So this is uh, just a reproducibility test that, that, that I want to show. Because the, the, the whole thing is still ongoing, so I'm not going to show the, the results under the strain because it, like because of the pandemic I have to pause it and then that part of the data is still kind of uh, ongoing. But here I have the uh, reproducibility test with a single crystal YZ and the absolute value of impedance here uh, doesn't really matter because here I just want to show if I operate the device under the same condition I get the same signal. So for example on the top left when I measure the impedance uh, of the sample at 350 C. Uh, there are actually nine spectrums there. And you can see they almost just perfectly overlap to each other. And between the nine measurements, I didn't just consecutively click my like mouse button nine times and then say, oh, my reproducibility is very high. Between different measurements, I changed the condition of the device to other condition and then come back to the original condition and then measure the impedance again. So this basically shows the ability of how accurate the device can achieve, and then also the reproducibility of the, the measurements. And in the end, uh, I, pr I, try, I purposely prolonged the um, uh, measurement time. Uh, here on the right, right side, basically this is the spectrum under the same condition with that 350C, but between that it has been a lot of measurements and then it has been around five hours. In the end, the, however, the 
impedance only differs around 3%. So I would say the reproducibility of these uh, devices at high temperature is very, very good. And the work is still ongoing, so uh, I hope that I will have the chance to update with everyone once we get more exciting results. <coughs> and in the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about the ultra high electric field effects on defect formation. So when we, like when I mention electric field, what do you think about? For me, I just like, okay, there's some electric current thing like lightning and light bulb. But however, in the science world, um, there are two applications that has a very big connection with the electric field. One is flash sintering. Basically, you have something on the center, but other than just raise it to high temperature or apply stress, you pass you you pass to current or like you apply a very large voltage and then they'll and then you can center your material at much lower temperature and then in a much shorter time. And memory as I mentioned about it is uh, emerging or now is actually already very popular among a lot of groups and it is a storage device that you can use for you know, formic uh, computing. So the question is what does the electric field actually do in nanoscale? For flash sintering, usually you will apply a very high voltage, like you have to apply at least 100 volts and above to make it happen. Um, <clears throat> for memristor, usually the operation voltage is comparably low to 100 volts. It's usually like one volt. And I think above like two or three volts are considered, considered quite high. So what's the difference between these two? Um, even though for flash sintering, the voltage is very high, the samples usually uh, is, is considered like a bulk uh, sample that you can hold with your hand. Uh, so if we convert the um, like uh, voltage to electric field, which is basically divided by the size of your sample, um, for fast entering, it will be around one K volt per centimeter. However, for memristor, even though it is just operating under one volt, the sample is very, very thin. It is usually ranging from one nanometer to 10 nanometer. Uh, so you can see the electric field strength can range from one megavolt per centimeter to 10 megavolt per centimeter. <coughs> so although these two uh, physical property or these two electric field and applied bias, they all couple together because they will just appear at the same time, they actually have different contribution influence on defense. So people, already know using Nernst equation to understand how the bias can affect the, short, uh, the oxygen vacancy in sulfur oxide. However, how the electric field affects the oxygen vacancy, it is still a question that we can ask. To further help identify what's the difference, I know people don't like equations, but please just let me show this one. Um, when we uh, like a defined equation state, including both the potential term and the, the electric field term, here, this is the potential term that I did that I just um, defined, which is basically the bi uh, bias that you apply and then times uh, multiplied by the charge of your, of your species. The electric field is actually uh, related to the dipole moment of the species. So these are actually two different terms, although they appear at the same time. So previously, people don't really care about this term because this term compared to this term is very, very small. The electric field term is comparably small to the potential term. However, here, um, here the electric field in the mercury is very, very high. And this term will become non-negligible and it will be comparable to the potential term. So previously, um, uh, Dr. Yusuf uh, studied the electric field effect on the oxygen, neutral oxygen defect formation energy. And basically this term is very important. Basically it's a difference between of the dipole moment P between the defected cell and the perfect cell. As you can see, the relative formation energy drops. Um, like when you apply the field for barium oxide, it's very obvious and then drops around like 0.3 EV when it is around 10 megavolt per centimeter. So <clears throat> here I just want to say that electric field term will become like very important when the field is very high. And then this is uh, what we are going to uh, ask for the more complex oxide next. So why does the dipole moment or the polarization for the defective cell is higher um, than the perfect cell? Here, um, basically, I'm showing the electron charge density 
uh, in the vacuum site. So in this vacant site, this is a magnesium oxide. When you, and the top row is basically no fuel, and then the down row is around 20 megavolt per, per centimeter. So visually for magnesium oxide, the electron charge density change a little bit, but it's not that obvious. However, for strontium oxide, we can already see clearly that the shape of the electron cloud is being polarized into one direction, um, and then it is not symmetric anymore. So because we don't have the oxygen atom anymore, uh, those two, two electrons, which is the definition of a neutral oxygen vacancy, the oxygen leaves without taking away the electrons, so everything stays neutral. Um, oxygen was like acting like a confining potential, and then once it is removed, the two electrons basically just become more free, the vacant side, and then it can be polarized more. So that's why for the, vac uh, for the defective cell, we can have a higher dipole moment under the same field strength, and then that's how we can assist the defect performing when we apply the field. So that was just a warm up because people don't really like really use alkaline binary oxide in any kind of uh, application. Uh, so I now we turn to the ternary function oxide strontium titanate. To study the field effect in strontium titanate, it is not a trivial work because the band gap of the strontium titanate is not as high as the alkaline binary oxide. So if you just use traditional method, you will either get a, like a metallic solution, meaning that your electron will not be stay in the vacant site and then you just form a metallic solution. Or if you use DFT plus U, um, in the end, you will have a very, very bad dielectric constant, as I've shown here as a right triangle, if you use the DFT plus U. Uh, basically, it is orders of magnitude uh, difference from the real value. So here we create a new method that we can actually capture the macroscopic material property, which is the polarization or the dielectric constant, uh, and the, the nanoscale local electronic property, which is the electrons behavior, like accurately at the same time. So this is very important because uh, this allows us to study the electron, electron behavior in this kind of functional oxide, which have relatively lower band gap than the, the alkaline binary oxide on the electric field. Um, and here I'm just showing uh, some of the some of the work that we get. Uh, we can get this nonlinear non relationship of the polarization at low field. Uh, this gives us a high dilated constant of STO. And then you can see when you apply the field, <coughs> Uh, to higher and higher, the dielectrons and actually drops very fast. And then this is also already verified by experiment that the, this kind of material, the ion movement will be impeded when you apply the electric field higher and higher. And then soon after, the dielectric constant will just go, go down to around tens of, or around like 20s or 20s. Um, so in summary, um, like I, in today's talk, I talk about how the strain uh, affect the electron defect strontium tightening with the simulation work verified by experiment. I have a short demonstration of the, uh, our experiment design, which can apply dynamic strain to basically all kinds of sample as long as you can fit into that device at the operation condition. And third, I show a simple showcase of uh, like how the electric field can affect and assist defect forming in both by the alkaline binary oxide and then also in strontium titanate, which is also uh, ongoing work that we are going to like wrap up soon. Uh, so in the end, I want to thank my lab mates. So I'm co-advised by Professor Yodis and Professor Van Vliet, which is in the lab of electrochemical interfaces and material chemomechanics. And two very important collaborators I have, one is Mostafa Yusuf, he's now in Egypt, and Thomas, which is helping me grow the sample, uh, the, the thin film of my experiment. And these are my like friendly group members. This is from the UDIS group. We took the picture in the selfie corner at MIT now. And uh, this is the, our group meeting after the pandemic when we just using Zoom. Uh, and I think all the funding, including MRL, uh, MERS MIT Nano, MERS Digital Computing Resources, and BOE, and Think Global Education Trust. And thank you for your attention. Well, congratulations, Yanting. Thank you very much for this talk. Uh, very much appreciate it.
Uh, at uh, this moment, uh, we can take any questions. If you have any questions, you can send me a chat or alternatively, you can raise your hand and I will uh, call upon you. Uh, any questions from the audience? Um, the, uh, as the, those questions are lining up and we don't have too much time for them, but uh, let me attempt uh, to ask uh, just the one or two. So uh, the uh, tests of the strain uh, of, uh, on, on your metal oxides are very much dependent on the design of your substrate. And you pointed out that the center part of your substrate is a point where there is zero, ten zero tension or compression, and then above or below there is tension or compression. Clearly with the change in temperature, which is what you're modeling, the substrate itself will also have different types of mechanical responses to that temperature change. So how do you account for that or the, uh, um, you know, the interface between the substrate and the metal oxide will similarly have additional, uh, call it confusing <laughs> elements uh, that in being able to identify the true nature of the oxide itself. So if I understand the question correctly, uh, basically it is thinking about, because thin film and substrates are different material and then they might have different thermal expansion coefficient. So when we apply, when we raise the temperature, basically the sample might just have some pre-strain. So uh, I just want to point it out that that's actually why we use one sample. Because at the same temperature, even if it is pre-strained because of the thermal expansion, when we apply the strain, they will have the same starting point. And if we are thinking about that, okay, if that's okay, but how about different temperature? They will have different kind of pre-strain because of a different temperature. Then the best thing we can do is we can narrow the temperature range that we test. For example, we don't have to range from 100 degrees C. We can test the temperature from 300, 250, and 400, or uh, we can choose a material that has a close thermal expansion coefficient to elim eliminate the effect. So that's why this technique is very special because it gives us more flexibility of the substrate choosing. Because we are not, we don't really care about what is the initial, initial strain that we apply using the substrate. It can be zero, it can be some finite value, but the real strain, it is applied by us. So. Yeah. Uh, a quick question from the audience. Uh, what would be a commercial application of your findings? Commercial application? Yes. Uh, I will say, uh, I haven't actually thought about that question, uh, to be honest. <laughs> but I will say this will be a very uh, handy technique, uh, if, I, if I can make it work nicely, uh, to basically quant quantize a lot of different effects. So in my research, I, learned, I care about the conductivity of the functional oxide you know, under the strain. However, strain can do a lot of things that I, as I mentioned before, and this device is basically just flexible in all ways. You can change a lot of different conditions. So you can think of, in the end, maybe I will have a very fine machine, then can apply all these three and four different parameters and then measure whatever you want. So I would say, maybe I cannot sell to a normal customer, but maybe it's good for MIT to have it in the end. <laughs> uh, you mentioned in your talk that you're using MLA-150 for the uh, actual patterning over in TRL. Uh, there's a new MLA-150 in MIT Nano, and I'm yes. told that we've seen lines even sub-micron uh, with this new yes. tool. Uh, but of course, you can always use an e-beam to generate yes. your patterns. Uh, exactly. Any choice why you haven't yes. attempted that to get you that better definition? Yeah, originally my goal of the finger length is one micron. So that's like the awkward length of, should I choose e or should I choose photolithography? And I had previous experience of using photolithography, so that's why, I, okay, I can sacrifice and make it a thicker, so I use photolithography. Of course, if I want to go thinner, definitely e -beam. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I know I've passed up quite a number of questions, few questions to you, primarily from me. I don't see any raised hands. I, and I'm also looking at the time. So uh, at this point, I will conclude the seminar. I will thank you, uh, Yen Ting, again for uh, really a, an inspiring talk. You have certainly uh, exposed us to the metal oxides in a way that we don't necessarily always get to see. So thank you very much for that. I will choose to uh, give my reaction uh, to, uh, to your talk. <laughs> thank you. uh, uh, and please uh, do, uh, do, do the same if you feel the same. Um, I would uh, conclude by simply uh, informing you of the upcoming seminar. Uh, you, well, this coming uh, uh, Thursday, 
uh, we will get a talk that explores the limits and expands the limits of performance of perovskite solar technologies. Um, you will uh, hear from uh, Jason Yu the work that has led to the record efficient setting of performance of perovskite PVs. So I hope uh, you choose to join us for that at 11 o'clock on Thursday. All right, we'll uh, see you soon. Thank you all.